Today we're resuming our study on uh, evolution after viewing the film Evolution vs. God last week. And today's uh, subjects will be basically about defining terms because as we go forward we'll be using some of these terms over and over and you need to know what I mean by these terms and what, uh, what scientists mean by these terms and I think it helps to, for us just to spend a little bit of time defining those ter terms uh, and definitions. And then next week we really start getting into the nuts and bolts of evolution, if you will. We'll start looking at uh, uh, embryology, uh, uh, homology, and looking at some of the uh, evidences that have been put out uh, in the past regarding these issues as it concerns evolution. And so really next week begins, like, like I say, the nuts and bolts of, of, the, of our topic. But the first thing I want to look at today is a definition of evolution because this, is, this creates a lot of confusion. There's a lot of confusion on the word evolution. I think you saw that last week in that film, did you not, um, on evolution versus God? Because some of the scientists in that film were not describing really evolution when they were posed the question, you know, give me an example of evolution or example of transitional forms. They were, they were, really, they were really giving evidences of what? adaptation. And so that's going to be one of our key themes in this, in this uh, study is knowing the difference between evolution and adaptation because that's not what we mean when we say the word evolution. We're not talking about adaptation which I think most of us in this room would agree occurs. You can see it if nothing else you can see it in domestic breeding. The breeding of dogs and cats and horses and cattle and things like that. A lot of variation, a lot of adaptation can occur, and of course it can occur, it can occur naturally, just as it can occur when you're trying to do it when you're, when you're doing breeding. So let's look at uh, two definitions of evolution that I think are, are very good definitions of what I mean when I say the word evolution. And the first comes from that little book I've talked about several times in six days from Kerr C. Thompson. It's a little bit lengthy and a little bit scientific, but it really gives a great definition. And he says, Following the laws of physics and chemistry, the concept is, meaning evolution, that through natural selection, operating over vast periods of time, fortuitous favorable events happen that brought about successfully more complex biologic chemicals which, again, either fortuitously or through some undefined property of matter, concatenated, and that's the ability of elements to bond with each other and form other elements uh, from atom and atom, leading upward to protocells, living creatures, then man himself. I mean, that's, that's what we mean by evolution. Uh, elements or chemicals came together. Of course, you have to just, the first thing you'll have to decide on that is how those elements uh, become into being to begin with. But that's another issue we'll talk about later on in our, in, uh, as we get on with this class. But those elements are uh, our atoms came together, joined together through these bonds, and then eventually put, produced something living in the form of a, what he calls a protocell. That's a kind of a pre-cell. And then these cells became more cells, living creatures, and then eventually man. That's evolution. That's the definition we're going to use in this class. I shorten it by just saying molecules to man. So when I say molecules to man, evolution, this is it. And that's what that... That's what that definition encompasses, doesn't it? It's molecules, starting with molecules to man. Now, a shorter version comes from our, uh, our friend Bolton David Heiser, and I think it's a, just as good an evolution, a, 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 uh, just as good a, a description or definition of evolution. And he says evolution means that all of life on Earth developed from one or few simple life forms. These alleged simple ancestors developed in a natural way from non-living matter. Again, non-living matter molecules and then life forms that eventually became man. And again, this creates quite a bit of confusion when you ask somebody, do you believe in evolution? You better ask them you know, to define evolution before they answer that question. And this is what we mean by the word evolution. And it's obvious in evolution, it's obviously, excuse me, it's obvious in nature that there is a wide variety of, uh, there's a wide variability within kinds. We see that, and I'm gonna show a little, uh, before we get to that, again, don't be fooled by the evolutionists who want to make synonymous the general theory or macroevolution with a special theory or microevolution or adaptation. Okay, again, adaptation is microevolution. And again, as I was about to say, there is a wide variability within kinds. 
you might say wide variability within species, but even within kinds themselves. And I show a picture here uh, of what I would what I would label as a group of kinds. And so you see up there um, a fox or fox-like animal, and then you see a wolf, coyote, domestic dog, you see on the left-hand side jackals. I would put those all in the same kind, would you not? Okay, so there's a variability. Now they're different species, these are not equals. If you use the word species, these are different species, but they're certainly I think fall within that same realm of the of the of uh, the word kind, and we're going to spend a minute in a, just a second looking at the word kind. Now, within human beings themselves, Homo sapiens, human being human beings, there is a wide variability. I mean, we have every kind of race, uh, color, uh, height, uh, width, uh, uh, hair color, eye color, you name it. I, I like this next slide because it shows. Uh, the tallest man in the world and the shortest man in the world, but are those not still human beings, homo sapiens? Wide variability between even the same species. And in this species, we're talking about homo sapiens. So we understand variability within cats, dogs, animals of all sorts, and there's no denying that. What we need to look, spend a little bit of time on though is what does the word kind mean? Now see the word kind in the Bible. Uh, but kind and species are not synonymous. Again, this is an important, an important point. Currently, there's at least 12 different def definitions of species. So when you start asking someone about evolution within species, between species, then you gotta look at what, how you define the word species, and there's all kinds of definitions. And the, the word species actually came from uh, the, the translation of the Bible for the word kind. In, in the Latin <coughs> Vulgate, the word kind was translated species. This is probably unfortunate because it has led to some of the confusion. Now in our Bibles, we, we still have the word kind, but in the Latin Vulgate, the word species is used for kind. And so species and kind are not interchangeably, are not interchangeable. There's even a, a group of, of uh, scientists, if you will, that do studies on what constitutes different kinds. And this is called baromenology. And baromenology is the study of kinds. And it comes from the word bara, uh, Hebrew word for create, and then men, which is the Hebrew word for kind. And there are people that study these things trying to determine what does constitute a specific kind. Because that can, that can be a little bit difficult sometimes to really constitute what that is. Sometimes, like I say, it's obvious. You know, dogs, cats, cows, horses, but sometimes it's not quite so obvious. And there's a whole study regarding that. And again, the word men, our kind, is used at least in three different areas in the Bible. First of all, in Genesis 1, when uh, God created the various kinds. Uh, and then they reproduced after themselves, didn't they? We see that again in Genesis 6 and 8. That is in the story of uh, uh, Noah and the flood, where first of all, he was to bring the different kinds into the ark. And then in Genesis 8, when they left the ark, the kinds again were to reproduce. So animals reproduced within the confines of their kind. So that's one way you can sort of look at what would constitute a kind, whether or not they can reproduce with each other. And if they can, that's pretty good evidence then you've got a kind. Uh, to my knowledge, I've never seen a cow reproduce with a horse. I've never seen a cat reproduce with a dog. That species or that kind doesn't exist that I know of, I've never seen that. But we do see some animals that reproduce within their kinds. And again, I wanna make it clear, species and kinds are not synonymous. Take that, take that with you today if you don't take anything else from this class. Species and kinds are not synonymous. Species is defined by man. So when we get to the taxonomic categories and classifications, man has come up with species, not God. God uses the word, and the Bible uses the word kind. And so kind is defined by God, not man. And again, sometimes we may not know and cannot delineate exactly where that mark is between one kind and the other, but God does and God knows. And so God has defined that. 
So we talked about again this ability to reproduce. Can kinds reproduce with other kinds? I haven't seen that happen. Species can certainly in, uh, uh, reproduce within, within each other. And we've got a couple of uh, examples of this. And there's many more you, you could put on there. One of the ones that's not on here is like a mule. Uh, mule is a cross between a donkey and a horse, right? So they're the same, they're not the same species, but they're two kinds uh, uh, breeding with each other. We have a jagalion here. That's a jaguar with a lion. Different species, but you can, they can breed together. And these are obviously real animals. These are not, these are not fake photography. <laughs> they're, they're real animals. On the far right on my screen is the lynx cat. Well, what's the lynx cat? That's a lynx that's bred with a domestic, a domestic cat. Uh, and so you have the lynx cat. And then you got the z-donk. Some people use the word, uh, what's the other word for z-donk? Uh, zonky, right, zonky. And so what is that? That's a zebra mating with a donkey. And then finally you got the liger. Now I thought liger was only from Napoleon Dynamite, but apparently there really is a, a liger. And that is a male uh, lion breeding with a female tiger. Now when you get these hybrids, if you will, that's what they're called, hybrids, when, they, when this happens. We've got different uh, kinds uh, breeding with different kinds, or not different kinds, but uh, same kind breeding within each other, but different species breeding with each other. Uh, they don't always have the ability to reproduce themselves, right? A mule has a hard time reproducing. I think there's rare cases where maybe they can, but they have, they have, they're not fertile usually. So they, they don't reproduce. So you've got to be careful with the back. Well, if, 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 uh, if, if there can't be that reproduction between each other, then maybe you've got a different kind now. Okay? So that, I'll be a little careful with that. doesn't mean you've, you've created a different kind. You still have the same kind, but you have two species mating with each other. So um, this, this is not correct. I thought we had changed this. Family may, okay, family may properly be defined as order. No, that's, that's, that, that's not correct. Uh, family may properly be defined as kind. So I may, that's, that slide is a mistake. That word should be kind at the bottom, not order. Uh, or, some people have tried to use the word order to equal kind, and that's too broad. In fact, Michael Denton in his book likes to use the word order to equal kind. I think family, when we start looking at the taxonomic chart that, that we're, that we're going to talk about in just a minute, I think the word family more fits our word kind. But again, family is a man-made term. That's not, that's not a God-made term. So we have to, have to be careful by doing that. So clearly, Natural selection allows for adaptation, and we see that over and over. That's how you can have these very different animals that are in the same kind. That occurs through natural selection and adaptation, and we shouldn't be afraid of that word, natural selection, when we understand what that word means. We're not talking about evolution. We're talking about adaptation and differences in uh, kinds to equal different species. So adaptation equals microevolution. Molecules demand equals macroevolution. I really don't, and I think I put this in the paper, I'm not a big fan of that word microevolution because of what the confusion it, it conveys with the word evolution. But people will use that and they'll use it interchangeably. So when you see that word microevolution, just think adaptation. We see this in the medical world, world a lot, you know. Viruses mutate, they evolve. Bacteria mutates, they evolve. Well, they do. They do mutate and they do change, but they're still a bacteria. But how do we get bacterial resistance? It's that way. You have adaptation. Gen genetics are already in there. Sometimes there is a mutation that can occur within that bacteria vi and virus to make them uh, more uh, where they're resistant to antibiotics and so forth. But they're still bacteria and they're still viruses but they do change. But I prefer the word adaptation. And you saw that again in our film that we saw on evolution versus God last week, didn't you? Because every time he asked one of these scientists to show him uh, uh, an evidence of evolution, what, what did they use? They used really adaptation. In fact, did we see any 
did any one of those people in that film give uh, that interviewer an instance where evolution was seen? No, they, they, didn't, they didn't give one. One of them gave the, 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 uh, a certain species of fish, uh, and then another one looked at the, the, the finches of, of Darwin on the Galapagos Islands, and none of those are really evidence of evolution. They're adaptation. And so, again, sometimes it can be fairly, fairly easy to turn, uh, see the difference between one kind and the other, sometimes not. This is a little short quiz. Which one would you put in a different kind on this film? Uh, you got an animal on my far left, looks like a, a fox, and then you have these other animals, looks like a lynx, a lion, saber-toothed tiger there at the bottom, domestic kitten in the middle, and then on the far right you've got a tiger. So which one of those doesn't fit? Which one is not like the others but it might be in a different kind? The wolf? Yeah. But those other three I could put in the same kind. Couldn't you? They're all feline. You know, they're all feline. One of them is extinct now, a uh, saber-toothed tiger, but it was still a tiger. It was still in that feline uh, kind. And so, like I say, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. Um, but I would, I, would, I would put family to equal kind, at least now, but I would be careful with that one too. And the reason I'd be careful, because family is defined by man. And so uh, it more to me represents the differences some scientists would go above family. I would not. So let's look at taxonomy. What is the word? Because we'll use, we'll use taxonomic classifications from time to time in this, in this class. So we need to know just a little bit about taxonomy. You don't need to be a specialist in this because I certainly am not either. But taxonomy, what is that? Ta taxonomy is the discipline in science that classifies organisms into groups based upon similarities. So. You know, we, man likes to classify things, likes to put people in different classes uh, that we've just talked about, feline and, and canine and so forth. So we look at a group of animals that have very close similarities and we put them in a certain class or family, correct? That's what taxonomy is. Uh, taxonomy really got its start in the 17th century and a, bi a fellow by the name of uh, Carolus uh, Linnaeus, 17th century Swedish botanist, actually started the classification system that most people are using even now. That classification is still used now. Does the 17th century predate evolution? Well, obviously it does. Evolution uh, was uh, the, the, on, on the origin of the species was uh, published in 1859, so clearly predates it. But it's still used because it's still a good classification. So some people say, well, classification systems are based upon evolution. No, they're not. Some, have, some classification systems are. But the one that most primarily is used by most people, and you'll see this in your textbooks, textbooks I'm going to allude to later on in this class, are still using the Linnaeus classification. Uh, and it's a hierarchical system of seven different levels that are from smallest to largest, species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, and kingdom. So when you hear the word homo sapiens, that's us, right? That would be the species and the genus, okay? Just as an example. So this is the system that, that you'll see used frequently. And we give an example here of a grizzly bear. That's what that is on there, that's a grizzly bear. The genus and species name is uh, Ursus arctus. The family would be Ursadia of the order carnivore. And that's why I think order is too broad to put kinds in because carnivore has a lot of animals in it, doesn't it? Carnivore is a meat-eating animal. By the way, grizzly bears can eat other things besides meat, but they are meat-eating, just like humans can eat other things besides meat. It's in the class mammalia, or a mammal. It's in the phylum chordata. That means it has a backbone, spinal cord, basically. That's what that phylum means. And then finally, the kingdom animal, animalia. You have plant and animal. Those are the big classifications, plant and animal and then you go from there. So that's the taxonomy system. There's another slide we have here. It's a little hard for me to read from where I'm at, but hopefully you can see it. And it starts, we have our grizzly bear on the left. That's in the kingdom, Animalia. Then it goes down to the phylum, but you see what's also in the phylum chordata there. It has various things, and even, even including a snake. So clearly kind wouldn't be in the phylum, would it? 
then you have the class mammalia, and of course that's all the mammals, and clearly kind would not fit for mammalia either. And then you have uh, uh, the order Cornivora, and then family. And then when you get to family, look at what you see the pictures of. I hope you can see, they're a little hard. But you have uh, a panda bear on the right, and you have what looks like a black bear in the middle, or some, some sort of bear, and then the grizzly bear on the left. And what is in common with all those animals? Well, they're all, we would call all those what? Bears. But they're different species of bears. They're not the same species. And so you get down to the genus and then the species. And I'm not sure the genus there, it looks like the grizzly and the uh, black bear may be in the same genus. And then you have the specific species of the grizzly bear. So that's the taxonomic system that is, again, currently used. But again, one more time, I, I can't hardly stress this enough, all taxonomic classification systems are defined by man, not by God. So we have to still be a little careful. So, 18th and 19th century taxonomists followed a typological, a typological method. That's how they did this classification, not based on evolution. So understand that too, because some people will say, well, the taxonomic system is based on evolution. No, not, not the one that's most primarily used. And what does, a, what does type, a typological method mean? For the typologist, each individual member or class confirmed to all essential details to an archetype. Uh, a theoretical and purely hypothetical entity, but they would use the, the, the idea of an archetype, things that had similar structure, you know, and so forth, uh, to come up with their system. Now DNA is being used some, uh, but primarily we're still using by the, still, the classification is still by the, the typologist. So, and this is a key, this is a key statement right here, because if you're looking for evidence of evolution, what would you expect to see either in real life or in the fossil evidence? You would expect this, and that is, if these groups or classification or classes could be arranged linearly or sequentially and connected together through a series of transitional forms leading back to one original source, it certainly would give much more credence for evolutionary theory, and that's probably putting it mildly. If you could do that, if you could see linearly where a bear became a dog or vice versa, dog, species, uh, dog kind became a bear kind, uh, horse kind became a cow kind, I'm, I'm, I, just anything along that line. Fish became a mammal. That, that's even a bigger leap, isn't it? To get out of the water and get on land, that's even a bigger leap. But if you could do that, if you could see that, and you could see that lineal sequential increase and change in, in kinds, where now you do have truly one kind versus another kind, that would give a lot of evidence for evolution. But intermediates are virtually unknown. They're just unknown. You don't see them. And so this is, to me, is where the theory of evolution, besides anything else we're gonna talk about in this class, this is where it falls. You know, you should have millions and millions and millions of transitional forms evident in the fossil record if you had to follow this lineal sequential form to get from one kind to another kind. Would you not? You would. You don't find them. You just don't find them. You find evidence of adaptation, as we said again from our, slide, or from our presentation last week, Evolution versus God. You see evidence of adaptation in the fossil record. You see a saber-toothed tiger in the fossil record. It's still a tiger. Now, we have extinct animals, yes. The dinosaurs, you know, aren't with us, but they, they're died out. Is that surprising? We don't have more species now than we did centuries ago, you know, millennia ago, did we? We have, yeah, we have less species, or at least less kinds. At least less kinds. Keep, keep to the word kinds. Why? Because of extinction. So the fact that something extincts proves nothing. Show me the transitional forms. They're virtually unknown. Again, this is key. This is key. Michael Denton says, it is impossible to allude, <coughs> excuse me, to any more than a handful of cases where the pattern of nature seems to exhibit something of a sequential pattern. Just a handful, and that is just alluding to of something so the transitional forms are not there. 
And so I'll summarize everything by saying this. At the species level, typological differences can be hard to delineate because a polar bear looks like a grizzly bear and a panda bear looks like you know, a black bear. So that's at the species level. So at the species level, typological difference can be hard to delineate. Agree with that. But at the levels above the species, typological methods hold almost universally. And there is no reason to believe organisms were ever converted to another group. And that, again, you just don't see that. French biologists, and uh, th these are the names, George Curvier, American zoologist Louis Agassi, Richard Owen, a British anatomist, rejected evolution. Um, even Asa, uh, Asa Gray, Gray's anatomy, also, uh, a great anatomist in, in the United States, rejected evolution. But they weren't necessarily rejecting it on a theological basis, okay? And, and that's sort of important too, I think. Now, we can reject it on a theological basis. We're Christians. I understand that. But they, they rejected it because it lacked empiric evidence for sequential pattern, patterns in nature. That's why they rejected it. They didn't see those sequential patterns. And the reason they didn't see them is because they're just not there. So what was uh, Darwin's response to Asa Gray when he asked him about this? He said, one's imagination must fill up the very wide blanks. Okay. <laughs> what an answer. Is that a scientific answer? Um, but that was, that, was, uh, that was Darwin's answer to Asa Gray when he asked him about the sequential patterns. Why aren't they there? Uh, You've got to have a lot of imagination. Uh, again, what Darwin thought was eventually the fossil record would prove his point, and it just doesn't. All right, lastly, we're going to spend a little time on the geologic column because there's a lot of confusion on the geologic column. Some Christians will say the geologic column doesn't exist. I would not say the geologic column doesn't exist. It's got problems, but I'm not going to sit here and say it doesn't exist. But there's a lot of imagination with it as well. How is it defined? This comes straight from the textbook that we use in here in Texas by Miller and Levine. Paleontologists use divisions of the geologic time scale to represent evolutionary time. The geologic time scale is based upon the concept of geologic columns. Kind of circular reasoning there, isn't it, when you look at that definition. But, in fact, the geologic column was not invented by evolutionists. So to use that definition is, is kind of silly because that's not how the geologic column even came into existence. It wasn't used to represent evolutionary time. That's not how it was designed. But yet that's what you'll see in your textbooks. They say that uh, evolutionists describe, and uh, actually they didn't say that, this is what I say, but evolutionists describe the geologic column It's a vertical line of many different rock formations that represent every year of the Earth's history to this day. In other words, you take the Earth's history at zero, okay, where there is no Earth, and then you go up from there. So that's where the concept of geologic comes from the evolutionary st uh, standpoint. So as a result of that, how old is the Earth supposed to be? About five billion years, that's what most people say. So about four and a half billion years of those rock formations would not contain any uh, fossil remains, right? Because there was none according to them. So any fossil remains we see come at the last 650 or so million years, according to the evolutionists. And this is just a little concept of what we have here. Uh, now this is not the full geologic column. This is the geologic column in the Phanazeric Eon. The Hadean Eon is the eon where there's no fossil record. It's where all the four and a half billion years are where there's just no fossil record. So this represents the Phanazeric Eon and then you then you have ages and eras and so forth. At the bottom of that uh, graph would be called the, pre, the Precambrian uh, 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 age. And there's very, very, very few fossil records there. And then as we go up, you see the Paleozoic era. And at the bottom of that is the Cambrian. It's funny how this graph just lists them all. And it doesn't separate them that well. And then you get into the Mesozoic. And each one of these is delineated even further uh, to periods and times. And then you see our Jurassic area, where the era where the dinosaurs were. And then the most recent would be where modern animals are, or uh, mammals occurred. That just, and you can see these in various textbooks all over the place. This gives you more of a concept with the rock layers on the right, and I know it's too small, I apologize for that, but uh, maybe uh, if you watch the, the YouTube you can see it a little bit better. 
but it gives you the rock formations that correspond to all these. And so you got the concept that if you were to take, at least I do, and I don't know if you had this concept where you were in, in school, but it, you got this concept that if you took a drill and you drilled deep enough, okay, you would come up with all these layers. And shouldn't you? I mean, shouldn't that be what you should see? If the geologic column exists everywhere on Earth, that's what should happen. If you took a drill and you went as far down as you can go, and by the way, just the Phanozoic era alone is supposed to be 100 to 200 miles in depth. That's a long way down. I don't know if we can drill that far, but that's how far it's supposed to be, even before you get to the Hadean era. But that's what you would expect when you did it. We also have the concept of index fossils, and we'll talk about that from time to time because these rocks that we looked at before are frequently dated and most commonly dated by the fossils that are in them. So you find an index fossil. So let's say you found a, a trilobite. You know what a trilobite is? We're going to study that later on, so you will know before this class is over, but it's a little, little tiny, tiny animal that uh, was in the uh, Cambrian era, if you will, according to the according to the evolutionist concept of geologic hawk, well, you would automatically date that rock based upon that fossil because of that fossil only lived in that era, according to them. So they identify the rocks by the rocks they're in, then they're, then they're used to date rocks. Does anybody have an issue with that way of dating, by the way? That's a circular reasoning. That's classical circular reasoning because you're, you've already determined that that animal lives in a certain rock bed, and so when you find it, that rock bed has to be that age. Now, once again, I want to emphasize, because <coughs> you'll say, well, the geologic column is all a, figure of, or a figment of the imagination of the evolutionist, and it wasn't. Geologic column was devised by catastrophists and creationists before 1860, and it was used to affirm the Earth was formed primarily by catastrophic events, quite opposite than what what we, you may think. And so keep that in mind. Geologic column then is used to describe, again, it's, a, it's eras, oh, excuse me, eons, which again, it's the Hadean and the Phanozoic, then eras, then periods, then epochs, and then ages. The, the Precambrian era, which is where fossils began, is where most of the time of the Phanozoic era uh, occurs or eon occurs. It's 88% of the Earth's history, okay, according to the geologic column at least. And there's almost no animals in that. And that's 88, 88% of the Phanozoic uh, eon. And so it represents 80%, 88% of the Earth's history after the Hadean eon, according to the geologic time scale. So that means that evolution didn't occur, doesn't, evolution, even according to the evolutionists that use the geologic clock, doesn't have four and a half billion years to occur, according to them. It could only occur within the last 650 million, and really not even then, because most of that time, 88% of that time, was pre-Cambian, for which there's almost no fossils. Some would argue that all those fossils that are quote-unquote pre-Cambian are really Cambrian, even the ones that believe in the, the geologic clock as we talked about now. So is the geologic column real or just a hypothetical construct? I want to look at a few problems. Again, the Phanozoic Eon that we just talked about a little bit, which is supposed to be 100 to 200 miles thick and should be found everywhere since it represents the entire timeline for the Eon, but it doesn't. It only exists in a few places, only about 50 locations or 1% of the Earth, can you find anything that looks like that? The Grand Canyon, pretty big hole in the ground, right? You would expect to see all the geologic column in the Grand Canyon, but you don't. You don't, you see about half of the column there, at most. Nowhere does the entire column exist in the full thickness of at least 100 miles, nowhere. It's supposed to be 100 miles deep, to 200 miles. That's according to the, the, the scientists that believe this. The average thickness of the geologic clock uh, 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 a column is only a mile, even where it exists. And the deepest is 16 miles. So you already see there's a problem with the geologic column, don't you? There's already a problem. The, 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 biggest, the deepest it is is 16 miles. And here's the other thing that's interesting. Hundreds of locations, the strata does not match the order. Do you have a problem with that? So you understand that means they're, they're, finding, they're finding some fossils that are older 
than the fossils that are underneath them. But yet, they're going to date those fossils because the circular reasoning says that the trilobite only lived in the Precambrian area. So you got a few problems with the geologic clock. So clearly, the geologic column and the geologic time scale or clock, as it's depicted in those pictures and in most textbooks where you will see it, doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist like it's supposed to exist. There's nowhere does it, do, does it exist there. And the relatively few places, and there are some places where they have the 10 Phenozoic periods exist, those can be explained both by an old world and a young world uh, definition uh, or explanation. You don't need an old world necessarily to explain that. Even if you take the concept or you see those few places where those 10 periods exist. Now, having said all that, my point is the reason that geologic clock, you know, they want to give millions and millions of years is because it takes millions and millions of years for evolution to occur, if, if it can occur at all. My point is no matter how many millions of years you assign to the age of the earth, the evidence for evolution is still going to be abysmal, <laughs> meager. So whether you buy into the geologic column or clock or not is really irrelevant when you're trying to study evolution. So what we will do is from, from time to time, because we have to, because we're studying evolution, and you're going to hear people talk about Cambrian and Precambrian and Jurassic and all that, we will refer to those geologic time, time periods, uh, whether it has merit or not, because the evolutionists think that it proves it, but what it actually does, even their own geologic column and fossil records actually refute it.